So chapter 7 comes in two parts. Um, and it'll probably take about three days to do it. The first part is what I call 7A, and it involves understanding IT governance and the systems development life cycle, SDLC. And the second part, 7B, focuses on documentation techniques, an extremely important um, section as we move into doing our work with Microsoft Access and designing database systems. So part 7A is the systems development life cycle, and that's where we are today. Um, a bit of a tough so session. Hopefully, you guys will stay awake. How many of you saw the movie Lincoln a couple of years ago? I loved that movie, but a lot of people hated that movie. Because it was a movie not about all of the exciting things that happened in that era. It was a movie about the process, the process that Lincoln went through to try to get the Emancipation Proclamation through Congress, and how complicated that was. So it was a movie about a process. Well, this is a lecture about a process. So some of you might not find that exciting. It's not as exciting as it could. So let's bear with it as we go through a lecture about a process. And that process is the systems development life cycle. But first, let's talk about the concept of IT governance. Um, governance, or IT, you can easily see a company, you know, because a lot of people don't really know IT, care about IT. If you're an accountant, if you're a senior manager, you know, it's kind of secondary in your mind. And so you say, I'll oh, let the IT guys do their techie stuff and let's not think about it. That's a very dangerous game. So IT governance is the process of the business owning IT. It's important that the business own IT because essentially it's a tool, a tool for implementing strategy. IT is not a tool for techie kind of people to implement kind of exciting new stuff for themselves. It's a tool for the business implementing new strategies. You need to figure out which systems are appropriate. Should you buy a system or should you build one yourself? Um, is it time? Have you outgrown the software you were using? Um, should you use it as an offensive tool to sell, not just to record? Um, should you have, you know, do some advanced data analytics? And these are just some of the questions. But essentially, IT is there to be a, an offensive weapon if you so choose. There are really three motivations for developing a new computer system. One is somehow or another you're not fulfilling your needs with your current systems for a variety of reasons. Two, new technologies are out there that make it possible to do new and interesting things. When the internet came around, it created all new opportunities for businesses. So are there new technologies out there that make it so you should consider ways to change your, your technology focus. And of course, if your competitors are doing something, you might need to do it just to stay where you were in your competitive environment. Ultimately, implementing a computer system is about economics. Um, you need to make sure that you are implementing systems because it is rational economically, not simply because it is fun technically. So the definition of IT governance is it's a structure of relationships and processes that allow you to direct and control the enterprise in order to achieve the enterprise's goals by adding value while balancing risk versus return, economics, um, over IT and its processes. It links IT's processes, resources, and information to strategies. Some of the things that an IT governance committee will do is they will evaluate whether IT is matching strategy. They'll be part of the plan as to what should be done going forward, prioritizing 
requirements and planning requirements. They will look over systems implementations and then they'll always loop back to evaluate, prioritize, and implement. So this IT governance committee, who's on? It should have kind of as its titular head, the CEO, who doesn't get involved too often. But ultimately it should have a CFO and a CIO and senior management, and then their surrogates who are focused, you know. So there are surrogates to senior management who attend all the meetings and all aspects of it, from the operations to finance to technology throughout the business. They attend the appropriate meetings and oversee the IT function. Got it. Okay, so you have a concept check now. IT governance includes all the following except for one. A, B, C, or D. Anyone else? He says B. Who agrees? Who disagrees? Who doesn't care? It's B. You have to either di agree, disagree, or not care. You have to raise your hand for one of the three. Okay, so that's all we're going to talk about with IT governance. So every company needs to have an IT governance committee. And then secondly, the bulk of what we'll talk about today, every company should have some flavor of a systems development life cycle. Even in today's world. When, when things first started going in, from large companies, from kind of mainframe based systems to smaller distributed systems, there was this thought, oh, we don't need those form formal processes any longer. You can get away without them. But in fact, you do. You need to control your systems development life cycle. Maybe even more so as you have distributed um, technology. But you need to control all these disparate units that think they can do it on their own and won't have the same standards of quality. Most important. So in the textbook, they talk about two things, systems development life cycle and the systems life cycle. They're slightly different. So. This page will talk about the systems life cycle, just so we put the systems development life cycle in its context. Think of the systems life cycle like in Lion's King, Lion King's the cycle of life. You, uh, you create it, you start it up, maturity, it declines, and you get to create a new system. And the cycle goes around and around and around. You create a system, you start it, you run it, and then as it's getting old and wears down, you need to recreate it. That is the systems life cycle. The systems development life cycle is really talking about what's happening in creation and startup in the beginning of the journey, right there. Or we're talking about how do you go from not having a system to having a system. Two, two models, I think one of our, I think our textbook uses this model, I'm not even sure. Talks about it as a cycle, that's why it's a life cycle. You start off by planning your systems, and then analyze them, and then design them, you implement them, you run them, and then you go back through that cycle again. That's one picture you might see for the system development life cycle. Another picture you might see is a waterfall model starts off with systems planning, analysis, design, development, implementation, and running it, and then cycling back through. They do the same thing. I believe this is the picture you'll see in our cyber text. All right, you guys have another question. Remember, D. D, D, D. It is D. And up within D, the one that takes the most Maintenance. But we'll talk about that more. So this is it. This is the systems development life cycle. 
And notice we have a picture here with some circles and some arrows and some boxes and some diamonds. This is called a process map. In the second half of this chapter, 7b, we'll talk more about process maps. We'll just see them now. Um, but process maps are a way to quickly visualize something. So this is the process map of the system's development life cycle. It starts with planning, analysis, design. A diamond here is a decision point. Do you want to buy software or build it? In this case, do you want to buy software, yes or no? If yes, you go this path. If no, you go that path. And so this is the overview of the life cycle. So let's go phase by phase. So we're going to start off with system planning, that first box. So then as in any process map, you can take a box and break it down into more detail. And that's what we're doing here. So this is the planning box. So first thing you do when you're doing systems planning and the um, governance committee would be involved in this process is you review proposals from various parts of the organization for systems they think make sense. First question, is that proposal or that report or whatever they're suggesting, is, there, is that a strategic priority? If not, you send it back and they've got to figure out how to make it strategically important. Otherwise, why are you going to spend your time on it? If it is a strategic priority, you would then do a first level feasibility study to say, is it even possible to do? If it's not feasible, you send it back. If it is feasible, you get ready for the next phase. So the pro this first level planning is essentially to decide whether or not you should go even bother to go further. Relatively quick and cheap, so you don't spend a lot of money up front trying to figure it out. So we'll talk about it in more detail. First thing you do is you get project proposals. You do that by looking at your current systems, understanding which ones are working for you, which ones aren't. You look at them from a strategic perspective, and you use interdisciplinary teams to do that, meaning you don't just have technologists doing this. It's technologists working side by side with various uh, aspects of the, um, the business. And you identify different approaches for solving strategic problems. You then perform your feasibility study and you're going to see this throughout. At every step along the way in the systems development life cycle, you have these moments that we call checkpoints. You take a step back and say, does this make sense? And you, when you do a feasibility study, you do it on four aspects. A technical, an operational, a schedule, and an economic. So at each checkpoint, you, you follow through. Technical feasibility. Is there technology that's available and feasible and proven to use? So can what you want to be, have done be done from a technical perspective? And then you, within that, you have to decide how far on the leading edge do you want to be? Do you want to be on that leading edge where you're taking risk? Well, you know, the leading edge and then just the very tip of the leading edge is leading edge. You're taking some risks. Or do you want to be a little bit behind the curve so that you're not taking as much risk, but you're doing things that you can do? So is it available and proven? Um, and secondly, are the technical skills that are needed to get it done available, either inside your company or outside and attainable for your company's use? Do you have the skills to get it done, technically? That's the technical feasibility. Operational feasibility. The changes that you're making, will they fit in? Well, first you have to ask, what are the changes that you need to make? And then will they fit in? This doesn't mean you have, you cannot change the business because you're putting in a new IT system. In fact, you expect to change the business. If you don't change the business, you should ask yourself, why are we bothering? We're just going to replace the current system with a new system that does the same thing. You know, that's not really adding that much value, right? Maybe it'd be a little cheaper to maintain. So. The fact you're changing the business is not a bad thing, but you need to make sure you can change the business in a way that's feasible. Third, schedule. 
can you implement it using whatever approach you're planning in a time frame where you'll actually get the value from it? If you need something in six months and you have a system plan that's going to take you six years, why bother? By the time you're done, it'll be yesterday's news. So you need to have a plan that matches the schedule needs. And finally, the most important, economic feasibility. Will the benefits exceed the cost? Um, there are various ways to approach that. All of them, you know, economically, <clears throat> payback period, net present value, return on investment, internal rate of return. How many of you have heard of payback period? Everybody? NPV, net present value. Rate of return on investment, IRR. Okay, enough of you that I'm not gonna go through it all. When I was at Goldman, we used IRR, internal rate of return, to prove that the investments that Goldman would have to make on the technology changes we were going to implement um, were worthy. Which one of those four do you think most companies use? How many say payback? How many say MPV? How many say ROI? How many say IRR? The correct answer is payback. Why is that? I'll say they do it. It's the easiest. You know, you don't have to be smart and know discount rates and stuff like that and have calculators. You just have to take, well, we think we're going to make this much money at the end and we think it's going to cost us this much. Let's divide A by B. And that's how many years it's going to take to pay it back. And so it's easy. It's, it's back of the envelope kind of stuff. And unfortunately or fortunately, most companies do it that way. More advanced will do any of these three offline, depending upon what works for you. Okay, so IT governance is intimately involved with the system planning phase. They're really involved with prioritization. If you think about it, it, this really, this whole process happens once a year. Think about it as like part and parcel budgeting. So everyone says, here are our technology needs for this coming year. You get this, you know, you have a technology budget, let's say, of 50 million. And after this planning process, you get $75 million worth of project requests for the coming year. And it's a responsibility of the IT governance committee to kind of prioritize them and then draw a line and say, we'll do those that are above the line, not do those that are below the line. So they, that's the prioritization process. Once you agree, once they say which projects are going to be done, they're announced formally to make them real. The project team for the next phase, systems analysis, will be identified. It's a bigger team. So you need to bring more people in, into it. At this point, you budget the entire project. Not just the analysis phase, not just what you're doing the next year. You attempt to budget the entire project. Because if you just budget the next phase, you know, it becomes incrementally more, more difficult to keep that momentum going. So you, would, you go for the complete project. Reality says it's often hard to do, but that's what you go for. And then the IT governance committee keeps their eyes on it throughout the process. Um, making sure that it's on task. So after planning, you do it systems analysis. In systems analysis, you get a larger team of more interdisciplinary people who essentially are involved with helping to make a go or no go decision. Preliminary investigation. If from that investigation you think you should succeed, you should proceed. You then go ahead and you you go through a study of what needs to be done. You have a decision point whether or not BPR is necessary. BPR is business process reengineering. So for any IT system. You need to decide whether or not there's going to be changes to the business. As I said before, you expect that there will be. 
So if there's BPR necessary, you need to identify what those changes will have to be. What are the macro changes unrelated to the technology? How are people going to work differently? And when you're done, you report to the steering committee so you can go ahead with the next phase, the design phase. So the analysis phase. The study of the current, system, current systems, you observe the systems, you review the documentation, and any information about internal controls. Documentation sadly tends to be a little lax in most companies because it takes time and energy. And, and you don't want to spend time documenting, you just want to spend time making money. Um, so you do those things. And then you interview stakeholders. You might use a questionnaire or a survey. You might have an interview. Um, for the most part, we'd rather have open-ended questions. You guys know open-ended versus closed-ended questions? Interviews are more effective when you have a question that doesn't allow the respondent to answer in a very closed, specific way. You want to open them up to talk in whatever direction their mind goes, that's how you learn more. So an example of an open-ended question here is, please explain why you are either satisfied or dissatisfied with the current system. And then closed-ended questions are when you check off the box. So in this case, you're getting a why. In this case, you're just getting a sense of whether they like it or not. This interviewing of stakeholders is a very important step in the overall um, um, process of creating a new system. So a very important part of that interview process is to engage the end users, the people who are going to feel threatened by your system. Right? Because people, especially if you're doing BPR, you're changing their business, they're either going to say, oh my god, I've got to learn new things, or they might say, oh my god, I'm going to get fired. You know. Because you know, one of the ways that you get a good IRR in a project is by re reducing headcount. Or they could say, if you do it right, hey, I want to be part of the change so that when the change happens, I'm part of the solution and they're more likely to keep me around. Some people embrace that, some people reject that. So the process of these interviews should allow you to see who those change agents are so that you can embrace them through the rest of the life of the system. Because it's very, very hard to succeed if you don't get buy-in from the stakeholders. BPR, Business Process Reengineering, is the fundamental rethinking and radical redesign of the business processes to bring about dramatic improvements. So as I said, every project should include this, or at least consideration for it. And the challenge is to figure out how the business should be run and then ensure that it is done that way. At the end of the analysis phase, you do another feasibility study, same four categories. You should know more. But you, always, you, know, you don't want to keep investing as the costs get bigger and bigger and bigger um, if it doesn't make sense. And you produce the systems analysis report. This report becomes the input to the design. This analysis, which describes what you want to do in, in human terms, becomes the input as you design a system for technology terms. So now we're in the design phase, and the design phase starts with a conceptual design, but then goes through evaluation and selection, and the decision whether to build or buy. That's all part of systems design. The conceptual design. You look at different technology solutions. Are you going to do it on the internet? Are you going to do it um, on a mainframe? Are you going to do it using C++? Are you going to use Microsoft Access or whatever else? You, you design based upon a variety of different um, possibilities. Once again, you do a feasibility after you look at those design possibilities. 
but some of them will just not be possible at all because they just don't make sense for any of those four reasons. The end of the conceptual design. And then you go into this build or buy. Build or buy. Before you make that decision of build or buy, you have some more detailed designs. You take the conceptual design and you take it down another layer. You need to do the detailed design because you need to make sure if you're going to buy that the software you're going to buy actually meets what you need to do from a detailed perspective. At the end of doing your detailed design, you have a specific specification report, and then you submit your specs to potential vendors. They send you proposals, and the submission of the specs is called an RFP, a request for proposal. They send you proposals, and then you'll select a specific vendor on a variety of different reasons. You might make the decision, you don't want to buy it, you want to make it. There are various reasons why make is a better decision than buy. Then you would just submit the detailed design to the IT department, who will then do the bill. They will use that as a basis for the technical bill. One of your early decisions is whether or not you want to hire consultants to help you with the process. As a former consultant, I'd say definitely. <coughs> why, why might you hire consultants? You hire consultants up front here before you submit an RFP because one, you may not have the resources to do it, two, you may never have done it before, so you don't know how to do it successfully. Three, consultants have done it before. They know this kind of stuff very well. They can make it happen for you better. Um, so they can simplify the process of submitting an RFP. Now the downside of hiring consultants, even a consultant from one of the big four accounting firms, they have biases, right? Their biases may not align exactly with your needs. And so you need to be wise to that before you start working with someone. They may have a relationship with certain vendors that help them. They may want to be part of the process towards the end when you implement it, that's where the big money is. And so they want to steer you in a direction that's favorable for them. So when you hire a consultant, you should hire a consultant with eyes wide open, know what you get. Once you hire that consultant or not, you send out these RFPs, requests for proposals to a variety of vendors. This should say, evaluate proposals, not RFPs, that word RFP is wrong. You evaluate the proposals from the vendors. Now this process, this process of sending in proposals, is a very, very, very strict process. It needs to be in by five o'clock on Friday afternoon. It needs to have these components to it so that you can compare apples to apples. If a vendor misses the deadline, more often than not, they're out. They, they, they've lost their chance. So it's very important that you understand that you need to respond with your proposal in a timely fashion. Once you've um, gotten your proposals, you go through some type of analysis, we'll talk about that, to select the software product you want. You then purchase that software. You then determine the modifications that need to be made. Because there's no way a software product is going to be exactly what you want. The most products, if not all of them these days, come with books that allow you to change it. Remember, when you purchase a software product, you're getting their object code, not their source code. Remember that from last week? Their object code means you're getting their zeros and ones. You're not getting their human language almost program code. Because they don't want to do that after that way. That's their ground. So they don't let you into their code to make changes. They do let you have hooks into it to make changes around it. And then you design the specifications for the change. If you're going to buy some of the things you might consider when comparing vendors, price of course, 
features, feasibility, all the things we talked about, technical and timing, etc. What kind of support they offer? Will they offer you some people who will help build it? Will they offer you people on site for the first year? How compatible is their software to all the other software you have in your building? And what's their reputation? Do they have a reputation as being strong in customer service, being weak in customer service? You'll probably want to talk to others who have used that software before you make the decision. Selection, package selection. There are different ways to do it. In this case, in this model, you have a series of criteria, just a few for, for this example. Each of those, those criteria is given a weighting between, um, well, a weighting that adds up to 100 points. So the most important weighting here is, did they adhere to the instructions laid out by the RFP? Did they understand the project? And then down the line, for other points. <clears throat> Then they're each, in this, in this model, they're given a score between one and three. Three being they did a very good job, one being they did a poor job. They're then given a weighted score, so if they got three out of three, like here, they got the full 25 points. If they scored two out of three, then they got two thirds of those points. 16.7. In this case, they scored 1 out of 3 out of 15, so they scored 5 points. You then take all these point totals, you add them up, you look down below, and you see that vendor 2 scored an 81.67, and the others were, what, 68 and 50. Okay, which vendor did we choose? Who says 2? Who says 1? Who says 3? Who said 1? Just raise your hand. Correct answer is one, because that's the CEO's brother who owns that company. Yeah? No. My point being, this is an art, not a science. Clearly, if you just did it scientifically, you would choose two. Right? But at the end of the day, you use this matrix or a matrix similar to this for the purpose of kind of giving yourself a sense between the three. And then you think about some soft issues, and the decision may not be as obvious as what the matrix tells you it should be. Here's a, just a totally different way of doing the same thing. To give you a sense, there's no one right way of scoring different proposals. In this case, you, you have your various criteria. You give each criteria a point total between 1 and 10. So you weight them a little bit, not as much. And then you give each vendor a score up to the maximum for that criteria. And which one are we going to choose here? A, B, or C? Based upon the matrix B, but you know, you know I was going to, you said something I was going to say was wrong. so. <laughs> Yeah, but the matrix says it should be big. <coughs> now, you may have, that was if you did the buy option. Remember in the diamond, you could build or buy. How about building? You still have this higher consultant. Step right up front. Not for the purpose of sending out an RFP, but for the purpose of helping you to consider your design alternatives and complete your detailed design, et cetera. The reason you'd use a consultant here is a similar reason. You may not have the resources to get this done yourself. If you do it right, you'll find a consultant who has had experience in this space before. And so things that may not come naturally to your organization, they can help you through the process of understanding how to um, so you can then get smarter at it. So if you hire a consultant, you're doing it so that they can help you do this job 
better than you would do it by yourself. And you have the same issues. The consultant you're hiring up here probably wants to help you with the implementation. So know that they may have biases in that regard. And so you have to manage your consultants. You can't just assume that they're working to your best interest. If you manage them correctly, then you um, run. <coughs> Coming out of the design phase, when you do a build, will be a detailed design specification. Think of this as a document that is produced by the design team, that's handed off to the implementation team. Assume totally different people are gonna read it, and if you could read this design document, you can then implement the system exactly right. And so, it's very important this detailed design specification be written in a way that a separate party who wasn't involved in this process can pick it up and move forward. Some of the things you need to consider are your inputs, outputs, and processes, databases, and your internal controls, the major functions of any computer system. You all are going to be doing this. We're going to develop logical models. I said, you know, this leads us into, um, hopefully before the end of next week, doing some of this stuff, which is our goal. You develop logical models. You translate those logical models into physical models. Physical models are models you can then implement into a database system. You design inputs and outputs, meaning screens, or anything like that, and ports, or anything like that. Once again, you do a feasibility analysis to make sure that you're spending the amount of money that you believe is appropriate. Let's talk about it. You start off with a logical model. I know that as I talk about this, it's going to be confusing for the vast majority of you. But we're going to do so much of this, most of you will get through that. So don't worry about it if you're confused today. This is for another day, but I just want to introduce it here. A logical model has a couple of different components. The first of those components is an entity relationship model, an ERD. Remember we talked about this thing called object-oriented programming? I mentioned that this gets us to understanding object-oriented programming. A course is an object, a registration is an object, a student is an object and the relationships between them uh, matter as you develop your computer system. And so, entity relationship models allow you to relate the different objects that will interact with the system. A process model is some, we'll be using something called a data flow diagram. doesn't focus on the relationship between objects. It focuses on how data passes from one object to another. And in different pictures, you have a student who's an entity. You have a database. It's a cipher database. You have a process. Database. We'll talk about data flow diagram on Wednesday. So you have logical relationship models and logical process models, logical data models and logical process models. When you're done with that, you'll then learn how to develop a physical design from the logical design. Physical design is specific to a particular database management system. In our case, it's a relational database management system. So which is how most modern systems are. And so we'll be focusing on tables. Tables are the physical entities in a relationship database. And you'll document them for the purpose of the development and implementation of the system. So you will all be doing a systems design of a build and then you'll implement that build later on. 
You'll need to design both your inputs and your outputs. Your inputs, uh, how are you going to get the data into the system? You'll describe what data elements you need, what fields, coding schema. Remember that from chapter or whatever. You'll determine how you're going to get that data into the system, and then what's it going to look like. You'll produce things called forms. Forms, which is the Microsoft Access input generation process. So form. Then you'll design outputs. In Microsoft Access, there'll be queries and reports that will allow you to grab data from the database and do things with it. And outputs don't have to be on paper, they could be on screens as well. User involvement in the design. Now, this, this is kind of techy stuff, but it's important that it not be done vacuum of the end user. And so in today's day and age, you do things like rapid development and prototyping. And that's really something where some, a tool like Microsoft Access comes in handy. You're probably not going to build a robust production-ready system using Microsoft Access. It's too small. It's, it's not meant for that. You use IBM DB2 or Oracle databases, you know, things that are bigger and stronger. But what you can do is mock up a system, make a system quickly that you can then show to end users, so show them how it's going to work. They can say, no, no, this doesn't quite work, move that there. Go back and forth with end users quickly and come up with a prototype that can then be used as a basis for the development. And so when done right, working with end users in the design phase is an iterative process. You go there, they come back go back and forth until there's an agreed upon system. You really don't want to do this without users because if you just implement it based on in a vacuum, you're probably going to be spending a lot of money fixing it after the fact. When you're done with the design phase, you have a specifications report with all the details. It's submitted to the steering committee for approval and then depending upon whether you're doing it in-house or giving it to a vendor, you submit it to um, the developers for implementation or the, de or the vendor for implementation. Again, a different group of people will be using it after you're done. What's the answer to this? B, purchase. You use an RFP to send a request for proposal to send to vendors if you're planning on doing a purchase of something. Systems implementation. Has two main components. Systems development and conversion. So that systems development first. The first step, systems development, is programming. Go in there and you write the program code it's where you have the computer science majors doing their thing. The second step is training, testing, and documenting, all part of systems development. If it costs a million dollars to do programming, how much do you think it costs to do this stuff? It's not more per se, but it's almost as much. This is a million dollars, this is probably 750,000. Because you have to spend the time to train. System testing, testing the software. You need to, if you do it right, test every possible occurrence of events, right? You have to test those things that may happen once every 10,000 times. You have to test the pathways that the computer program is going to take you to make sure they're right. It's got to be done both from a technical perspective and a business perspective. You need to test that the users um, 
can do their work. You have to test that it can handle you know, the, the bulk of the transactions that are going to come through. So this is a very big process right there, often under thought. And then there's conversion, which has two components. You convert the data. Most systems today are replacing older systems that have lots of data in it. So you need to convert the data from the old formats to the new formats. And then you need to figure out how are we going to get the people over into the new systems. This is just um, systems development, the steps to doing the systems development. You create the data, you do the detailed programming, you do your testing, training, etc., just as we talked about. As you're doing that, you have to make another important decision. Do you do it all in-house or do you use consultants or outsourcing? Are you familiar with the term outsourcing? became popular in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and it's still quite popular today. The idea being the cost of labor in markets other than the US market is far lower, whether it's India or the Philippines or China or South America, the cost of labor is low, lower. And this, you know, think about India or China, there are Matt, if you remember that first video from the very first day, there are lots and lots and lots of really smart people who can do this work. And so you might choose to outsource the programming to these smart people overseas who are getting charged, who are going to charge you a fraction of what Americans would charge you. Same, same work. The advantages of outsourcing. It allows you to co focus on what you're good at. You're kind of giving that work to somebody else. You can potentially save money if you're going to be paying someone one third the amount per hour. And most systems cost tens of millions of dollars. It'd be a lot of money saved if you do it right. There are some disadvantages though. There's the inflexibility. If somebody's going to do that work, you're going to tell them exactly what to do. They're going to charge you, you on a certain amount of money. And as you need changes to happen, they're going to say, no, 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 no. He told me to do this. And you're going to get, you know, you're going to be on different time frames. And they're going to be, they're going to be working at night while you're working at days. And you're going to have to, you know, find ways to talk at, you know, two times a day, late at night, early in the morning while you're still at work, or they're still at work. So these contractual relationships become complicated um, in an outsourcing world. So some of this cost savings goes away because of inefficiency. Um, not to mention the Philippines or India are great because generally speaking, the educated people in those two countries speak English. In China, you, you have a little bit of a challenge. Many educated people speak English, but not all. And so you then have language difficulties as well. Second is loss of control and loss of competitive advantage on who goes together. Quite often you make the decision to build a system because you think you're doing something unique that will change your competitive situation in your industry. You want a competitive advantage. As soon as you outsource, you're giving away that competitive advantage to this company in India, for instance. Believe me, they, they might sign non-competes and you know, um, promising that they won't um, provide information to others, but they're going to use that information, if not overtly, at least subtly, because that's how they make money. You do business with Goldman Sachs, you want to do business with Morgan Stanley. And so you're going to potentially give away your competitive advantage. So when you outsource, you should consider the function that you're outsourcing. If it's a true competitive advantage function, you probably don't want to do that. You don't want to take it to the outside world. Well, let's think about accounting systems, the reason we're here. Do you think that it's OK to outsource accounting systems? You're probably right, which is that you probably are not going to have a true competitive advantage in an accounting system. You'll probably be able to do things more efficiently, save some money by doing it right. But it's not as though giving away your crown jewels if somebody else understands how you're accounting. 
In fact, to go even one step further than that, not only would you probably be open to outsourcing an accounting system, more than likely you would actually buy an accounting system. Everyone accounts approximately the same way, and so it's a it's a high likelihood um, function that you'd be able to buy an existing system and implement that. Now, if you were an investment bank and you had a new and interesting way to do trading systems, you may not want to have some system. So, you look at the business function. Conversion. Data conversion. So you have all of these things, maybe they were in flat files, they weren't in relational databases, you need to get them into relational databases. My very, my, my second project when I was at Arthur Anderson, a long, long time ago, was for the New Jersey um, Unemployment Insurance System. Right? And my responsibilities was the data conversion. Data conversion. So yeah, we had to take all of the people who were unemployed, and you know, a database of all people who were unemployed in an older database system, and convert them to the new system, which other people were building. Now, we we're going to do that over a weekend. So when Monday came, it was going to be in the newspapers if all these people who were getting unemployment checks could no longer get their unemployment checks because I screwed up. And when you do government work, when you, when you do build systems for the government, all you want to do is stay out of the newspaper. That's your goal. Stay out of the newspaper and you succeed. And stay out of the newspaper in case you're curious. <laughs> so data conversion. You need to go from the old systems to the new systems. Systems conversion. How are you going to go about actually turning off that old system and turning on the new system. And there are different models. A direct switch, meaning you take the whole old system, and turn it off, take a, just recreate it in the new system, then go back. The advantages of a direct switch, if it's done well, is cheaper. Because you don't have all these bridges you have to create between old and new systems. The disadvantage, if you screwed up, it's big. It's real big. Again, you'll be catching newspaper government job. So you do this with care. The direct switch you do with care. Three other ways of doing it. Parallel. You operate the old system simultaneously with the new system. Both go at the exact same time. You compare results. When you're comfortable with the new system is going to work, you just turn off the old system, you got the new system, and everything's good. The disadvantage of that is it takes extra personnel, right? Everyone's doing things twice. So you need to do this um, carefully. And usually we do a parallel with one of these other two. So the parallel approach is to keep them both running together and only turning off the old system when you're clear that the new system will work. A phased approach. A phased approach says we bring it online one module at a time. So if you were to buy SAP or another ERP system, you don't implement the entire ERP system at one time. You say we'll just implement the accounting module. When that one works, We'll, we'll then implement their customer service module. And you go business function by business function by business function until you have the whole thing in. The advantage, you, you minimize the risk at any one point in time. The disadvantage of a phased in approach, you have to build all these bridges between old systems and new systems. So all of the old systems, if you did the accounting module first, would have to talk to the, the old systems will have to talk to the accounting module for a period of time. Then when you bring on the customer service module, you then get rid of those bridges you just built temporarily. Um, so you can have a cost associated with a phasing approach as you create these bridges from the old to the new until all of the new modules are in. This is done 
almost all the time with ERP systems. Because they're just too big. You can't do it all at once. And the last one is a pilot approach. A pilot approach says, well, put in the entire system, but we're only going to do it in Omaha, Nebraska. If something bad happens, no one will even notice. And so you use them as a pilot. You check it out and make sure it works. They have, hopefully, they're change agents in wherever you've decided to do it, so they're willing to work with you. They, um, they help you get the system working just right. They usually like to do it if you get the right people because they get to design the system to their needs and everyone else has to then conform to what they want. And so you use a pilot approach, convert Omaha, Nebraska. When that's working, you would then go location by location by location and implement it in each location fully. Also done quite often in this model when possible. Again, you need to build bridges because you're going to be running the old system and the new system at the same time. So you do all those same bridges, but you're not going to have a problem with parallel work. Um, you're going to have people doing two things at one time. <coughs> so four different ways of converting the systems. At the point of conversion, you want to prepare the physical site where you're going to keep the hardware. You need to get new equipment in front of everybody's desk. Um, you need to have new documents. If so, can you order those documents? Have you established the internal controls? I'm underplaying that here, but every computer system needs internal controls. You'll have your, how, I think I asked you before, how many of you want to be internal auditors? A couple of you, are. I remember. The other one was in Internal auditors are heavily involved before you go live. They make sure that the system is going, is not going to put the company at risk. You document the system from both a system's perspective and a user's perspective. And then you implement it. You go, you have that conversion weekend, everyone works 48 hours straight without sleeping. You get it in, and then you cross your fingers. Um, you obtain, in this post-implementation, immediately following implementation, you obtain feedback. You want to know what's working and what's not working. You want to make sure that your controls are strong because hackers will jump on it very quickly. So you need to look at those controls right away. You look at the statistics that come out of the computer systems to make sure that it's working in a, an acceptable fashion. Okay, which, which of these is not a method for implementing a new system? Okay, maintenance. Okay, you're in production, the system's been deployed. They use the system, now you have to kind of fix it. Because nobody's ever, in the history of computer systems, ever put one in without a problem. I don't know that to be true, but I'm pretty sure. So there are two types of fixes. The first one are more critical, they're corrective in nature. Something is just not working right. The company's having trouble running with the new system. You need corrective maintenance to get the system running right. Second is perfective maintenance. Things are okay, but they're not where they should be. You have a prioritized list of um, things that need to be done, and you start perfecting the system at that point. So corrective and perfective. As you, got, you all guessed at the very beginning of this discussion, you think about from planning down to development, that's the amount of cost. The vast majority of the cost is in maintenance. It's kind of like what's underground in an iceberg. You shouldn't be surprised by that. You should know that maintaining a system costs a lot of money. You check out performance, downtime. What percentage of the time is the system up and running? You know, if Amazon is down 1% of the time in the course of the day, that's their business, right? How much maintenance do you have to do? Are you, do you have enough hardware? Are you loading up your hardware so much that it's not able to, to keep up with your needs? 
are there any security breaches or attempted security breaches? And then watch your user satisfaction. So you monitor how well you're doing. As a project manager, you need to have tools to help you manage the systems development life cycle. And we'll talk about two tools here. And these tools allow you to divide your project into smaller tasks, that you can then monitor those small tasks, have relationships between tasks, you can't start one until another one is ended, etc. And with an estimate of how many resources are needed for each task. The first tool is something called a PERT chart, Program Evaluation and Review Technique. How many of you have heard of a PERT chart somewhere along the way? Got one? Okay. It helps you to identify critical paths and the duration of those critical paths. A project cannot be done faster than the critical path says it's going to be done. Unless you apply more resources logically. PERT charts together. So this is an example. So if you're a project manager and you're running an implementation of a project, your challenge is to keep it orderly, make sure that you are done on time and on budget, make sure that you're using your resources in efficient manners and effectively. And there are many, many tools that you'd have at your disposal to do that. Remember, these are these projects, building a, a computer program is not dissimilar to building a house. There are lots of different systems that have to be put together, lots of different parallel activities. A plumber cannot do an electrician's job. A systems tester cannot do a programmer's job. And so you need to assign people to the project in an orderly fashion. And so the per chart. The numbers in the circles are just the, pro the, the uh, kind of the project step number. This is step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. They have no other meaning except that they are kind of sequentially numbered in, in this case. The numbers in the parentheses are how long it will take that step to be completed in weeks. So that would say two weeks. It's the critical path. The critical path is 2 plus 5, 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 6 is 11, plus 3 is 14. So that's a PERT chart, a Gantt chart. Now you really use Gantt charts. Gantt charts are automated tools. Uh, Microsoft has one. There are many Gantt charts. You put in all the information at a very detailed level. So if you're a project manager on a $50 million project and you have 10 sub-project managers, and each sub-project manager might have some teams working for them. Each team would put in their own kind of information as to what they need to do. That all comes together into a single chart that shows the critical path for the overall project. Um, it'll look something like this. With all of the steps, normally you'd see this at a high level. You could click on one of these steps. It will show you the detail behind it. This, this would be the overall critical path of when that would be done for this step. And if you clicked on that one, you would then see the sub-critical paths below it that show what has to be done to make that step happen. It shows kind of um, prerequisites. You cannot start this, let's say, until this is done up here. And so you know your prerequisites. You can't start system testing until programming is done. And so you have all of this information loaded into a single system th that then shows at every level of the management team where you stand. And you know they do this when they build skyscrapers and houses. Well, houses probably not. Those are just contractors who are doing it on the seat of their pants. But a skyscraper, they're going to do this. Make sure that everybody knows when they're going and what they're supposed to do. Same idea for building a computer system. OK. Concept check. Which phase of the systems development lifecycle includes determining user needs? Someone who was here last time, because you'd have to see the video. To systems analysis.
Okay, that is it for chapter 7.